Hey there, welcome back to the Statistics Fun Room. In this video, we're going to take a look at confidence intervals. And over the next three videos, we're going to look at confidence intervals. And each one is going to be slightly different. In this video, we're going to introduce the idea and look at one particular application. So what I want to do is come back to the central limit theorem for a moment. In the last video, we discussed the central limit theorem and we looked at some uh, applications of the central limit theorem. Now in that last video we discussed that the central limit theorem describes a couple things for me. One is if I'm doing sampling from a population and I find the mean of that sample and then I plot that mean and I continue that process over and over plotting the sample means will create a normal distribution as long as we meet a couple conditions. So I brought up the notes from our last video real quick. And what the central limit theorem said is something like the following. If we know that our population is normal, then we can take samples of any size. And if we build the distribution of all the sample means, that distribution will be normal. And for this standard, D, excuse me, for this distribution of sample means, central limit theorem says that the mean of the distribution of sample means will equal the mean of the population. And then we have a relationship for what we call the standard error. The standard deviation of my sampling distribution will equal the population standard deviation over the square root of the sample size. Now part two said that if we don't know the distribution of the population, then in order to guarantee the distribution of sample means is approximately normal, we need to take samples of size 30 or more. We need to take samples that are large enough. Now some textbooks say that that threshold is 50 or more, some say 30 or more. So when we looked at this simulation in the last video, um, we, we did a couple things. So I just want to revisit that real quick. So here is a population that is normal. And I'm going to animate the first couple samples. So what I'm going to do is samples of size, let's do 10. And I'm going to find the mean of every sample and plot that. So I'm going to go ahead and do animate. And so here is 10 randomly sampled data points from the population. And there is the mean of that sample. And I would continue to do this over and over again. And so for each sample of 10 randomly selected data points, find the mean, and I plot that mean. So down here in this graph, I'm beginning to build a frequency distribution of every sample's mean. So let me just jump to 10,000 samples. So remember the central limit theorem said if my population is normal, then my distribution of sample means will also be normal. Now, what we're going to do in this section is utilize the central limit theorem. We don't want to take 10,000 samples. We can't afford that. It's very time consuming, very expensive. We want to take one sample. And we want from that one sample to try to figure out what the population mean is. Now remember what the central limit theorem says is that the mean of the distribution will equal the mean of the population. So if I come back to my simulation real quick, we can see the mean of my sampling distribution is equal to the mean of my population. Now, they might be really, really, really close to each other. They're not always exactly equal, but theoretically they are equal. Now if I take one sample, right, let's say that uh, right over here, let's say here was my sample mean from one of my samples. It's at this value, whatever that value would be. I can't tell. That's 16, 17, 18, 19. So let's say that's 20. So my sample mean is, let's say, 19. Right? Here's my sample mean of 19. Now my population mean is over here at 16. My one sample's mean is 19. Now I don't know, right? Theoretically, I don't know. And I should say, in reality, I do not know what my population's mean is. I do not know what the mean of the uh, sampling distribution of all sample means is. So I have one sample. Let's suppose it's 19 as a mean. And I want to be able to try to estimate the population mean and figure out what that value is. So in this video, we're going to do what we call building a confidence interval. So we're going to build an interval around my sample mean of 19. So I'm going to build an interval around that sample mean. We'll discuss these details in a moment. 
conceptually we're going to build an interval around that sample mean of 19 and I'm hoping to catch the population mean inside of that interval and that's what we mean by a confidence interval. All right, so what I want to do first here is I want to take a look at an application to, again, keep our focus on the bigger picture, why we're doing this. So what I want you to do for me is don't, don't take notes. Don't write anything down. I want you to just listen to the conversation. So I'm going to do the, the word problem, and then once we're done with the word problem, we're going to discuss uh, the skills of how we're calculating this confidence interval. So in this particular problem, we're told that a random sample of 37 business days, the average closing price of a certain stock was $112. And let's assume that we know the population standard deviation is $9. Now when we looked at our graph of our sampling distribution of sample means, we had roughly something like this. We talked about the mean of our sampling distribution of sample means, right? That was equal to the mean of the population. And then the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of sample means, we call that the standard error. That was the standard deviation of the population divided by the root of the sample size. Now, we have one sample here. We haven't done infinitely many samples. We have one sample here. And the way I like to describe this, like I just mentioned to you a minute ago, is we don't know what the population mean is. And our sample mean might not lie right in the middle. It most likely lies a little to the right and to the left. So let's suppose my sample mean was here. I want to build an interval around that sample mean. So I'm going to move a little to the right of the sample mean, a little to the left. I'm going to have an interval of numbers, and I'm hoping to catch the population mean in that interval. That's the big picture of what we're doing here. So when I find the sample mean of 112, I don't really know where this sample mean of 112 is falling in my distribution of all the sample means. So again, it could have fallen here, and we want to build an interval of numbers to the left and to the right to hope to catch that population mean in that interval. So what the instructions would typically say here is uh, find the, let's say we want to do the 95% confidence interval for the population mean. And the confidence, 95% confidence interval for the population mean. So again, we're trying to catch the population mean in an interval. So our approach here, actually what we're going to do, let me grab my racers, we're going to actually assume that the sample mean is the mean of the distribution. So I'm going to assume that my sample mean is right here and that that is the mean of my distribution, even though I know that that's not really correct or most likely it's not correct. So I'm going to build an interval around that sample mean. So I'm going to move a little to the left, I'm going to move a little to the right, and I'm going to hope that I've caught my actual population mean in that interval. Now, because we're building a 95% confidence interval, let me switch to green, what we are really looking at here is what is the distance that I need to move above and below the mean to catch the population mean. Now what our usual approach here is first, is we want to find this z-score. So what's the z-score that I move above? What's the z-score that I move below? Obviously this would be a negative. And we call this a critical value. So we denote this most textbooks as z sub c. That's my critical value. So how far above and below do I need to move? Now for this particular problem, what I want is 95% of the data to fall in that range. Now remember, this is the sampling distribution of all of the sample means, and one of these means, right, should be the mean of the population. So I'm wanting to catch 95% of all the sample means in this interval that I'm about to build. So the first thing I want to do is find out how many standard deviations above and below the mean do I need to move. 
Now, if I'm not allowed to use technology here and I'm doing this work by hand, I need to pull up my standard normal distribution table to answer that question. So in this case, I want 95% in the middle. So let me come back to my graph real quick. Now, if I want 95% in the middle, then what I have is 5% left over. So if I have 95% in the middle here, I want 5% left, so I'm gonna have 2.5% in the upper tail, I'm gonna have 2.5% in the lower tail. So because my Z table tells me what's in you know, the left region of a critical value, that's why I'm taking this extra step. So I want 0.025 in the left tail, and that's gonna tell me what this negative Z score really is here. So I'll pull my table back up, and again, I'm at the positive Z of the table. And, you know, remember if I'm at a Z of zero, 50% of the data lies below that value, right? Because that's the mean. So I need to move to the negative Z scores to find this value. Now back to my graph again, right? I want two and a half percent of the data. I want the area under the curve to be 0.025. So the kind of pain here is I have to hunt through this table literally and find 0.025 and then backtrack. That gives me the z-score, let's say. So let's hunt through here and find 0.025. So here's 0.025 right here. So the z-score of negative 1.96 would be how far I need to move. So, so let me stop for a second. Negative 1.96 would be this z-score so that I have 0.025 area under the curve. So I have negative 1.96 and then obviously due to the symmetry this would be positive 1.96. So if I move 1.96 standard deviations below and above the mean, I'm going to encompass 95% of all the sample means in that sampling distribution. Now, I don't really want the z-score. What I want to know is what are the actual data values. So I know the mean is 112. What data value corresponds to 1.96? So, you know, we use the standard deviation to determine that value. So we call that the margin of error. So in this conversation, the margin of error is how far we want to move around that sample mean. So the formula there is I'm going to use my z value and I'm going to spread the standard deviation that far. So this is how many units from the actual sample mean of 112. I know that that's 1.96 standard deviations, but what is that in regard to the actual data set that we have here? So we know that 1.96 is how far we want to move in units of standard deviation. And then within this particular problem, I have a standard deviation of $9, and we knew that our sample size was the root of 37. Excuse me, we knew the sample size was 37. So my standard error is 9 over root 37. So I'm going to pause for a second. I'm going to plug this in my calculator. And I got a value of 2.9 as my margin of error. So again, that means if my mean is 112, I'm going to move 2.9 units above and 2.9 units below. So we're looking at units of dollars. Right? So I'm going to move $2.9 above, $2.9 below, uh, my sample mean of 112. Now, as we discussed, the next step would be taking my sample mean and moving above and below my uh, sample mean. I'm hoping in that interval to catch my population mean. So the way that we're going to envision this right, is I have, let's say I have a number line. Here's my sample mean of 112. Let's call that x bar. So I'm going to add my margin of error. And I want to know what that upper value would be, my upper limit. And I want to take the sample mean and subtract the margin of error. And that's going to give me that value there. So in regards to the process of this problem, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to find x bar minus e and figure out what that number is. And I'm going to find x bar plus e. And that's going to give me my upper and lower limits to construct this confidence interval that we just drew. So in this particular problem, if I scroll back up, the sample mean was $112. And the e that we just calculated was 2.9. 
and then the hundred and twelve dollars plus two point nine so that gives me one this one excuse me is one fourteen point nine and this is one oh nine point one so that says if I go up to one fourteen point nine and I'm go down to one oh nine point one I have caught ninety five percent of all the sample means in that interval right I've caught ninety five percent of all the sample means in that interval and I'm hoping the population mean is in that interval so the way that we would typically interpret this if I'm gonna write a sentence conclusion I'm gonna say something along the lines of uh, with 95 percent confidence the population mean lies between those two numbers right? lies between 109.1 and 114.9 now sometimes depending on the textbook they'll put this in interval notation so they'll say it's the interval 109.1 comma 114.9 so that's interval notation or some books will say the population mean mu is between 114.9 and 109.1. So whatever textbook you're using, just pay attention to which version of the notation that they want there. Now this is the big picture of what we're doing in a particular application we're trying to catch the population mean in this interval so we're taking one sample to accomplish that. And Again I'm going to come back to my graph of my simulation and I don't really know where that sample mean is, but I'm hoping to catch it in my population mean. Now another way to kind of visualize this, I found another simulation online. This is pretty cool. So we're trying to catch the sample mean in that data set. Sorry, we're taking sample mean and we're trying to catch the population mean in that interval. Now one way that we typically interpret this is, let me come back to my picture. If I took, let's say, 100 samples and found the means, I'm 95% of those samples should catch the population mean. That's one way to interpret this. So visually, if I look at this uh, simulation, I'm going to find the mean of every sample. And let's suppose my mean was 112. We knew our standard deviation was 9, and we took samples of size 37. So what I'm going to do is take actually 100 samples. I'm going to build 100 intervals. I want 95% confidence. So let's go ahead and do my samples. Let me zoom into this graph. So what this graph is actually showing me, here's what the simulation did. It literally took 100 samples and it calculated the confidence interval. So the sample mean, excuse me, the mean is 112. Now remember, we're assuming the mean of the sample is the mean of the population, even though that may not be true. But here's our mean. And for the population mean of 112, we can see all of the green intervals are sample means and the interval around them. So for example, you know, let me look at this sample right here. Here's the sample mean and here's the interval around it. And I actually caught the population mean in that interval. Now if I look at this very first sample, here's the sample mean and the interval around didn't catch the population mean. Notice how it didn't catch the population mean. Right? So out of 100 samples, how many actually caught the population mean? So check this out, right? So 96 out of the 100 actually caught the sample mean in this simulation. And that's what we mean by a 95% confidence interval. That's really how we're interpreting that. Now again, we can't really afford to do 100 samples. So we're doing one sample and we're, you know, betting the odds, if you will. 95% of 100 samples, I should catch that population mean. And that's really good, you know, probability of, of accomplishing my task. Now, obviously, there is some error that is possible in this situation. We can see in this situation, one, two, three, four of the samples, right? we had 96 that caught it, four of them didn't. 
So there is possibility of error. And typically, if we're doing a statistical report and we're writing up the results, we would discuss, you know, what what are the what's the possibility of an error, and what are the issues if we actually have an error. Now, in a class of this level, we're not going that deep. We're not calculating uh, and discussing what that error means within that particular application. We're just focusing on the bigger concept of what a confidence interval is and that we're catching right, the population mean in that interval or hoping to. So now that you're done listening to me and we're focusing on the bigger picture of the application here, let's come back and let's focus more on the skill and the specific steps that we're going to follow. So usually step one would be we want to verify that we can actually use the central limit theorem here. I remember the central limit theorem tells me that my sampling distribution of sample means is approximately normal. And in order for me to have that guarantee, I have to either know my population is normal or I have to take sample sizes of 30 or more. So I need to check within the problem that I'm doing that I satisfy one of those conditions. So again, step one would be to verify that. Verify that either the population is normal that was crazy. My digital board just freaked out on me. So I'm going to verify that the population is normal. Now, I don't always know that. And in the real world, I typically wouldn't unless I've done a lot of experiments within the same data set. Um, and the other one would be uh, my samples are uh, 30 or more, right? We meet that threshold. So that would be step one. Step two would then to be find the confidence, excuse me, find the critical value. So we want to find the critical value for whatever the confidence level is. Right? So for a confidence level of C. In a prior example, we did a 95% confidence interval. We could build 99%. We could build 90%. Um, it would depend right, on what confidence level we want. We'll find that critical value. And then step three would typically be uh, calculate the margin of error. So remember our formula that we used in that prior conversation, we discussed why this was the formula. So once I find that Z sub C, I'm going to build that margin of error. And then the last step would typically be you know, calculate the interval. I'm going to say build the interval. So remember the way we're going to build that interval is we're going to take the you know sample mean and we're going to subtract the margin of error. We're going to take the sample mean and add the margin of error. And again, visually, here's my sample mean. I'm going to move E units above and I'm going to move E units below and that's going to give me my confidence interval. So as far as skills and process, these would be the four steps that we would move through in order to calculate the confidence interval. So let's work a little bit on these skills. So let's say the skill of finding the critical value first. So I'm going to do one for you and then let you do one for me. And for, first, what we're going to do is use the standard normal table, like if we were doing this by hand without technology. And then I want to discuss, you know, how would we do this with technology? So we already did the 95% confidence, so I don't want to do that one again. So just as a practice problem, let's find uh, the critical value for 99%, uh, let's say. So I'm going to do this one with you, and then I want you to try one for me. Now, if I'm finding the critical value for 99%, right, visually what I'm looking at is I want 99% of the data around my mean. So if I move above and below, right, what is this critical value that we're finding here? So I want 99% in that interval. Now, again, remember all the Z tables always give me area to the left. So I have 1% collectively in both tails. So I'm going to have, you know, half of 1% here, and then I'm going to have half of 1% in this tail. So, you know, this is 0 0.005 that I want out of my table. 
So pulling up my table, I'm hunting for 0 0.005. So 0 0.005 is actually smack in the middle of these two values. I have 0 0.0049, 0 0.0051. So whenever the value I'm looking for falls smack in the middle, I'm going to actually take the z-score right in the middle here. So let's see, 0 0.005 is going to be negative 2.5. I'm not going to do negative 2.57. I'm not going to do negative 2.58. I'm going to do negative 0.2575, right? So if I'm if I'm at seven and I'm at eight, seven, seven and a half, right? So 0 0.07, 0 0.08, 0 0.075 is smack in the middle. So negative 2.575. So I would have negative 2.575 here, and then positive 2.575 here. So what I want you to do is pause the video here in just a second. I want you to find the critical value for a confidence level of, let's do 90%. So pause the video, take a look at your standard normal table, find that value, unpause, and then come back and let's check together. All right, how did you do? Did you get the same value that I got? So I found a critical value of 1.645 in order to gather 90% of the data. All right, so here's my approach. Since I want 90% between my two Z scores, then I have 10% collectively in both tails. So I took my 0.1, my 10%, took it in half, and I got 0.05 in the right tail, 0.05 in the left tail. So again, I'm gonna pull up my Z table in a second. My Z table tells me how much is to the left. So I want 0.05 to the left of my z-score. So hunting through the table, poor 0.05. Where's that at? I am blind. I'm almost there. Ooh, here we go. So right here, 0.0495 and 0.0505. So 0.05 lies smack in the middle of those two. So again, if I'm right in the middle, I'm taking half of the, you know, I'm taking the midpoint of these two second decimal places. So 0.045 is going to be the midpoint. So where was I again? I was showing, oh, I lost my spot. Here we go. So negative 1.645. And there was the critical value that we got there. All right, now we've been taking the time to painstakingly find those by hunting through the table. I want to point out to you that most tables that you would find in a textbook actually have a summary of the most frequently used critical values for confidence intervals. So there's our 1.645 that we found for the 90%. There was the 1.96 that we had on the very first problem. And here's a 2.575. So some of the most frequently used confidence intervals, you typically typically would find a summary of on a standard normal table. Now, if I'm wanted, you know, let's say on this particular table that I have, if I wanted 85%, I don't have that here, and I would have to hunt through uh, the table like like we just practiced doing. If I wanted, you know, 92%, I don't have that as a summary. You might be able to Google search and find critical values for all possible confidence intervals. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't done that, but I'm sure that exists somewhere out there. Now let's discuss how we would do this with technology. So if I'm using a tool such as StatCrunch provided by Pearson, what I would do here is I would go to the Stat button and I would choose a calculator and I'm using a normal calculator in this case. Now for the values that we had there, like so the one you just did for me was 90% between, 0.9 area between. So I'm going to click the between feature and then these are the numbers that I want. I want these z-scores so I'm going to delete those and I want 0.9 between. So if I click 0.9 between there's my negative 1.645, positive 1.645 if we round as we saw in that table.
Now, one of the ones we did, the one I did for you, uh, was what was that, 1.99, uh, right? So 99% confidence. So when I compute, there's my 2.576, 2.576 here. Now, actually, I'm noticing a slight discrepancy here, right? Because don't I have in my table uh, 2.575? So we would typically want to go with what's in the table, but by all means, technology is more accurate in that case. If I'm using a tool like a TI calculator, and the way that I would do this, it would I need to go to the distributions menu. So I'm going to do second vars, go to the distributions. And this is a like a reverse lookup. It's called the inverse uh, lookup, right? So we have the area, we're going backwards to find the z-score. So I'm going to choose the inverse norm. And then here's, you know, 0.9 in the middle. So I'm going to Look for a z-score, so my mean is zero, my standard deviation is one, and then I would choose the center. So I want 0.9 in the center of my two z-scores. Go ahead and paste, hit enter, and there's my negative 1.645 and positive 1.645. So this is very efficient. You know, the efficiency also comes from if I don't have one of my standard values, so if I'm looking for 85%, right, the TI, I can do second VARs, do the inverse norm, and I could have, you know, 0.85 in the center. And then that Z-score would be negative 1.44 and positive 1.44. And then, you know, in stat crunch again, what that would look like here is I would just put 0.85 in between. Let me switch to the between feature and compute. And there's those two values as well. All right, now the second step would typically be calculate the margin of error. So if I scroll back up to this word problem, right, once we've looked up our critical Z value, we have to be told within the verbiage of the problem what the sigma is. We have to know our standard deviation of our population, and we have to know the, the sample size N. So within this particular problem, we had looked up the critical Z value. We were told the sigma of the population, right? standard deviation of the population was 9, and we were told our sample size was 37. So we plug that in, and that calculates right our z times sigma over root, and that calculates my margin of error that we denote e. So the next skill would typically be to calculate that margin of error. So I have to be given sigma, I have to be given n, and once I've found that critical value, z sub c, we can crunch that margin of error. And then the last skill we would typically involve, once we find that margin of error, we will be given the sample mean in our problem. So we will take the sample mean we're given, we'll add the margin of error, we'll subtract the margin of error, and we will get similar to what we saw in this problem where we are adding the margin of error, subtracting the margin of error, and that builds our confidence interval. So I want to do uh, one more problem, you know, some practice with you uh, to uh, have you apply this, right? Do these skills uh, and apply this to an application. All right, so let's do one together uh, to just practice, and then I'm going to have you pause and try one for me. So let's suppose that in this problem, we are wanting to estimate the uh, population mean of home values uh, in a particular city. So let's suppose we have a, um, we have a sample of 50 homes in Orlando. And the mean, I'm going to say with, that's better grammar. So with a mean of, uh, let's say, $250,000. And let's suppose that we know the population standard deviation. is let's say uh, let's say thirty seven thousand dollars 
So let's find the 95% confidence interval for the population mean. So just to discuss something with you here, I think I said this earlier, it is extremely rare that we would know the population standard deviation. Typically that is something we don't know. So in this section, right, in this video, in this conversation, we're pretending that we do know that value so that we can use the central limit theorem. And uh, the reality is we typically don't know sigma. So what we're going to do in the next couple videos after this one is we're going to address that issue. What if we don't know sigma? How could we possibly use the central limit theorem in that case? But for now, let's pretend we somehow know the population standard deviation. And we're just getting our hands dirty with how to do these calculations and how to interpret them. Now remember step one was to verify that we can use the central limit theorem. So we either need n to be greater than or equal to 30, or the population is known to be normal. Now when I read the verbiage of this problem, I see that my sample size uh, is 50. Right? So n is 50. So since n is 50, then we meet this condition of samples being more than 30, so we can use we can use the central limit theorem. So then step two would be to calculate the critical value. So step two for this particular problem, the critical value, let's find z sub c, the critical value was for a confidence level of 90%. And we already found that value. I think we've gotten some good practice with how to find that value. And that critical value was 1.96. Now step three would be to calculate the margin of error. So the margin of error was the critical value times what we call the standard error. So in this case, I have 1.96. And my standard deviation, we know, is $37,000. And my sample size was 50. And I got 10256. So I got you know, $10,256 as my margin of error. So then step four was to build the confidence interval. So we're going to do x bar minus e, and we're going to do x bar plus e. So for this situation, I, I scrolled out of my screen. If I remember correctly, the mean was 250,000, and we're going to add the standard error, excuse me, we're going to add the margin of error, and then we're going to take our 250,000, uh, that was supposed to be subtract, let me fix that. So we subtract and we add to the sample mean. So I'm getting 239744. And then I'm going to get, uh, what's that going to be? 260256. All right, so then our interpretation would be with 95% confidence. Uh, oh, wait a second. You know what? I just noticed a typo here. Oops. Let's come back and fix this real quick. Uh, this was 95% confidence. I wrote the wrong thing here. Now this is the correct critical value, but I had a little typo here. And let me just double check. My brain is on Monday. 95% confidence was 1.96. 95 is 1.96. Okay, I had that right. I had just a little righto there. So let's write our interpretation. So again, we're going to interpret this as with 95% confidence, the population mean 
of home values in Orlando lies in the interval. Let me say is in the interval is in the interval all right Monday stop messing with me is in the interval and I'm gonna write the interval notation here so two three nine seven four four comma and then up to two six zero two five six and again some books will write that mu, the population mean, is between those numbers. So let's just go ahead and write that as well to practice writing that notation. Oh, there should be a less than symbol there. Okay. So let's go ahead and discuss real quick how we would use some technology to do this for us. Right. So if we're doing all of this work by hand without any technology, Here's what that work looks like. Now, how would we do this with some technology? So let's discuss, let's say, the TI calculator first. So with the TI calculator, we're going to go back to the distribution menu. So we're going to do second VARs and go to distributions. And I want a cumulative probability for my normal curve. So I'm going to choose the normal CDF. So my lower limit is going to be, and actually this is not correct. I was thinking of something else, I apologize. So on a TI, we want to call up the confidence interval program. So what we're going to do is hit the stat button, and then I'm going to arrow to the right to the test menu. And you can see down here number seven is the Z interval. So I'm going to go ahead and hit seven. And then I have the statistics. So I think the default does data. So if I have the raw data, I would type that in. I have the statistics. So here's my standard deviation that I typed in already, 37,000. Here's my sample mean of 250,000 that I already typed in. My sample size is 50. My confidence level was 0.95. So when I calculate, it crunches that confidence interval for me here that we had gotten by doing this by hand. Now, if I'm using a tool like StatCrunch, I'm going to go to the Stat menu, and what I'm going to choose is ZStat. I had one sample in my uh, former confidence interval, and then I don't have the raw data. I have the summary of the data. So my sample mean was 250,000. My standard deviation was 37,000. My sample size was 50. Now you notice with StatCrunch, here's what we're going to do in a couple videos. We're going to calculate hypothesis test, and that's the default. What I want is a confidence interval. So I'm going to hit the radio button for confidence interval. I would click in here, change the confidence interval that I'm looking for, the confidence level, if necessary. And then when I click compute, I can see the lower and upper limit for that confidence interval. All right, so I was going to have you pause uh, and do a problem for me and then unpause and come back and do that problem together. But this video is getting a little bit long. I don't really like for these videos to get super long. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the video at this point. The very first example that we did is an example of an application. Here was another example of an application. So this discusses the concept of building a confidence interval and the steps that we would go through using the central limit theorem to make that calculation. In this video, we assume somehow we know the population standard deviation and this gives us the opportunity to go through the skills of how to apply the central limit theorem and doing that process. And in the next couple videos, we're going to look at the more realistic situation of where we don't know the population standard deviation. We're going to talk about how we would deal with that situation. I look forward to seeing you in the next video.